Good morning, good afternoon, and thank you very much for the invitation, Philip and Vincent. So we're going to talk about cryoablation, and who are the patients to pick? This is my disclosure slide. I speak for a Metroom and EpiMed who makes cryo machine, but I don't get paid for this talk by them. And I also speak for a couple of radio frequency companies. I'm not employed by either of them. I started my medical career in Budapest and I spent some time in the States and Canada and now after 10 years I'm back home again in Budapest. We started Pain School International with a couple of my friends. I'm on WIP Education Committee and I teach for a few societies. We are going to discuss the indications and this is essentially the summary of my talk as well. Peripheral neurology, joint innervation and also there is a use in acute pain. We'll discuss how to how to choose from cryo, pulse radio frequency and radio frequency ablation. And of course we have to look at the available evidence, which is, I have to admit, not that much at the moment. So cryotherapy, which is also called cryoanalgesia, cryoablation, cryoneuroablation, is essentially the application of cold to tissues. It creates a conduction block similar to the effect of local anesthetic. So this is how the cryoplob looks and you can see how big it is compared to a rib, which will make navigation of it much harder. And here you can see the cryoprobe, I was dripping uh, local anesthetic on it to check if it freezes prior to the procedure. And that's how a single use probe looks that you can throw away. And this uh, is a, sh a schematic uh, drawing of a nerve. When you do cryo, it will take away the myelin and the axon, but the epineurium, perineurium, and, and endoneurium remains intact. That means that the connective tissue stays, which in return leads to a regeneration of the nerve. And here you freeze, you lost the axonal conduction exactly at the level of the uh, trauma to the nerve, and over time it regrows and you re regain full function. Now this slide really summarizes the indications. You can target any nerve when the problem is the nerve. It could be a neurology, a nerve attrapment, a neuropathy, a CRPS type 2, and you can freeze that nerve away. Now you can also use cryoablation if the problem is actually an, a musculoskeletal problem, let's say knee OA or hip OA, we cannot fix the musculoskeletal problem, so we will denervate it. And recently there is increased use in acute pain, where by you freeze the nerve temporarily, you facilitate recovery from surgery. So the first, we're gonna talk about joint denervation, and I'm going to show you a one minute movie on uh, cryoablation of the inferomedial genicular nerve for knee osteoarthritis. We know that one picture is worth a thousand words, and I think a short movie is worth a thousand pictures. I'm putting local anesthetic all the way. Through this cryo probe, we cannot inject local anesthetic, so it's nice to anesthetize the target at the beginning of the procedure, and that's no concern anymore. After the local anesthetic, I am placing my introducer cannula that will help me to guide the cryoprobe. This is called a sharp cryoprobe. Nevertheless, it's not sharp enough to go through the skin. Once the introducer is close to target, I'm removing the, the actual needle. The cryoprobe slips in. I have to pull the, the plastic cover, plastic sheath back a bit so it doesn't cover my eyes ball. And I'd say my cryoprobe is on target. Let's freeze. Again, we're going to complete two 90 second cycle with a 30 second defrost in between. And this is a position where we can actually beautifully visualize the ice ball shaping 
with the probe in place. The tissue is shallow enough to see just everything so nicely. So this article discusses a multi-center randomized double-blind sham control trial. What they did is that they froze the infrapatellar saphenous nerve and the control was a sham. And what they found that there is a statistically significant decreased knee pain in the treatment group. So that's good. And this is a retrospective review of a hundred patients. What they did, they froze the infrapatellar saphenous branch and the anterior femoral cutaneous nerve to relieve postoperative pain. And the treatment led to decreased hospital stay and decreased opioid use. And these are all radiofrequency procedures for hip pain. Uh, the reason I'm showing them, they all show benefit for hip pain. All of them are small uh, case series. However, when we think of cryo, it's also a method of denervation. So one can extrapolate from this, these articles to cryo. Of course, it doesn't show, demonstrate with certainty that cryo will be just as good, but we can assume. And let's think about peripheral nerves. Uh, here is a recent uh, comprehensive algorithm on how to approach uh, neuropathic pain. And uh, this is where interventional pain therapies sit. So everything before conservative treatment, uh, medication management, and of course the multidisciplinary approach goes first and then you get to your whatever it is, cryo radio frequency or <clears throat> parts radio frequency. And that is followed by neuromodulation. So that's where it sits in the algorithm. Pulse radio frequency, uh, I would say we still don't know 100% what it does, but it changes the synaptic transmission, it changes the gene transmission, it has a neuromodulatory effect and an anti inflammatory effect. When you think of radio frequency, we know it coagulates the pro proteins and that's it, there is no way back. And again, this is a slide I showed you before, cryoablation creates a reversible lesion and the nerve grows back exactly the same way. Now, if you wanna compare radio frequency with cryo and PRF, then this table I think is a, is a detailed uh, answer to that. Cryo creates a reversible lesion. This can make you happy or unhappy, but it is reversible. Uh, it creates just as much motor loss and sensory loss as the local anesthetic did. And that's not true for pulse radio frequency, for instance. Now, because it doesn't damage the perineurium and the epineurium, the neuroma formation is, is really not likely, whereas with radio frequency, that might be a problem. Placement is harder for cryo than radio frequency or PRF, and that is because the cryoprobe is so big. If you use ultrasound, if you get a really good view of the probe, you see nothing behind it. If you use uh, fluoroscopy, then you really cannot do 100% tunnel view or coaxial view, because then it actually covers your whole target. So you need to do a bit of a coaxial view. Um, the good news is that with cryo, the denervation certainty is, I would say, is higher than with radio frequency. You put your probe there, it makes a gigantic ice ball, and you get it. And therefore, uh, also the pain relief is, is much more likely. Patient very often gets off the table already with no pain. And uh, of course, when we learn any procedures, the models are 18 years old, everything is super easy, anatomy is beautiful. And when you get to your real life experience, the patient is obese and 95 years old, and nothing looks like where you learned. So a bit of a help by a bigger ice ball actually does come handy. How long it lasts? We know radio frequency is six to 12 months. Some studies even talk about two years relief. Cryo, I would say six to 12 as well. In my experience, it's closer to six. And PRF is really short. Again, uh, if you look at the studies, most studies look at PRF for three months. Uh, based on 
my experience and personal conversations to many experts who work on peripheral nerves, it doesn't work that long. It's shorter, unfortunately. Now, there is a bit of a downside too. If you put uh, neurology and radio frequency, you get over a thousand studies. Now, if you do the same thing, neurology and cryoablation, you only get 130 studies. So that's a problem. Evidence and literature is not as vast as for radio frequency and pulse radio frequency. This is a review article uh, that reviews cryoablation procedures for chronic pain conditions. And if you see here, um, the, the number of patients are 40, 50, 76, 24, 2010, not very many uh, patient number. And it's used for lumbar medial branch, medial branch, medial branch, dorsal penile celiac, pudendal, and various peripheral nerves, these two studies. So we have some, but not enough. Now, how do you pick your uh, ideal cryo patient? First of all, you need one where the nerve involvement is very clear. The history will point to the direction. The, the mechanism of injury will already give, look, give you a clue. Oh, that's the nerve likely injured. You confirm that with physical exam. There is hyperesthesia or hypoesthesia. Uh, often patient would say it's a painful numbness at the area. And of course, you can look with the ultrasound. And if you see a neuroma or a swollen nerve, these will all point you to the direction that, yes, you got the right nerve. Now, you do a diagnostic block. I say a diagnostic block is really good if it's 80% improvement in pain. But, of course, if you look at the literature, it varies. But maybe the biggest one suggests 50% uh, relief is enough. I personally like when the patient gets off the table after one or two cc local anesthetic let's say to the occipital nerve, and she says, no pain, none. Now, that patient will be really, you're truly the best candidate. The one who would go like, yeah, maybe yes, maybe no, yes, it's numb. Those, I'm not so keen on cryoablating. And it holds true for other, other areas, ilioinguinal uh, neuralgia as well. If the patient sits up on the OR table and says, oh, I, oh my God, I wasn't able to sit up like this then you're happy. That's a good candidate. Uh, and one more thing that's important, you need to tell the patient that you can expect numbness. Uh, I, I had a lateral femoral cutaneous neurology patient that I completely took the pain away and the patient was very upset uh, because of the numbness I gave her. And I know Dr. Trescott had a very similar situation uh, so this needs to be discussed. I'm going to show a couple of cases and along those I think we'll understand which is a good candidate. So this would be a typical one. 35-year-old male, comes with groin pain. The patient is two years post laparoscopic herniography. And the pain is worse uh, with any abdominal muscle movement or abdominal distension. There's no, no way to do sit up, to carry any weight, or stand for a prolonged time, and he cannot have sex. Uh, if you look at the literature, you find varying numbers, but usually the prevalence of post hernia repair pain is between 15 to, to 35 percent, which is fairly high. Now, if you want to do something about it, first of all, of course, we need to understand the anatomy, which we do. There's ilioinguinal, iliohypogastric, and we know it sits between the transverse abdominis and the internal oblique. We can track it, and there we go. We need to know, though, and I'm not going to go into much details here, but there are uh, anatomic variations, well published. Sometimes the nerves, nerves go together, sometimes one is bigger or the other is bigger. So this needs to be understood. Here is what I do. Uh, I show this to the patient and they very often would say, oh yeah, I have the purple and the green. Those are my pain areas. And then it will tell me which is the most likely injured nerve. And I do a diagnostic injection with one or maximum two cc of lidocaine. 
at the nerve. If the patient develops numbness at the area of innervation, then I know I did a good job with the block. If there is pain relief, then we can call it a positive diagnostic block. So here you can see the, the well-known image uh, between the internal oblique and transverse abdominis. You can identify the ilioinguinal and iliohypogastric nerves. And of course, this is just one section where they are exactly between these muscles. They actually pierce through the uh, abdominal muscles and surface. So don't expect them to run all the way here. They will come up to the surface. Sorry, towards the ASIS. Now, shall we do cryo, pulse radio frequency, or RFA? Now, RFA can lead to neuroma formation. You want to avoid the large myelinated nerves. Uh, PRF, you, we can try, but the expected benefit is short lived. And then, of course, you can do cryo with the expected benefit of six months. Here, you can identify the ilioinguinal nerve between the appropriate muscle layers and of course you can visualize the ice ball as it comes from lateral to medial. More often than not I come from medial to lateral. So what's the evidence again case series 10 patients it's good results with treatment follow-up. Now here is the next case and that I offer it for consideration. What do we do with a patient like this? He's got an osteosarcoma at the femur that was encroaching on the sciatic nerve and or the patient had surgery because of the tumor and developed a sciatic neuralgia. What is the approach? Should we cryo? Should we RF? Should we PRF? I wish I could see you in person but now we'll just go with my answer. <laughs> That's how interactive it can get. So it, it always needs a very careful contemplation of the clinical scenario. If you look at these, these are very different. One is an end-stage cancer patient. Function is not so important. Pain relief is very important. So you're not going to mess with pulse radio frequency because what if it doesn't work and it, success rate is lower. You could do cryo. It makes a big lesion. It freezes the sciatic nerve. Pain will be gone for six months, nice and reliable. Uh, similar to RFA, again, you're not worried about sciatic function, the patient is bedridden, uh, you want to take the pain away. I say because of the bigger lesion of the cryo, uh, it's more likely to succeed. And this is a very different clinical scenario. Young patient needs to maintain the function. So now you're left with pulse radio frequency, essentially, even though the success rate is uh, smaller, you must preserve the sciatic function. So cryo and RFA, I would say, are not that great. And of course, again, it depends on how bad the pain is. Now, when it comes to phantom limb pain and stump pain, again, the distal portion of the nerve or the function of it is no longer as relevant. So you could do a lot of things. You could do PRF, but the benefit will be probably short-lived. You could do cryo because you can take away a function fully. You would consider radio frequency, but knowing that you can cause complete coagulation of the nerve and possible neuroma formation, I would opt for cryo. This is a case series of 25, uh, 21 patients with six month follow up. It showed benefit. And finally, we're going to talk about cryoablation in acute pain setting. Uh, most studies are available about intercostal uh, cryo and knee cryo, but it's not enough still. This one is a, a study, a randomized uh, controlled trial for pectus excavatum. It's a level one evidence that shows that if you uh, freeze the intercostal nerve, uh, the length of hospital stay and opioid requirement decreases. This is another one, a systematic review and meta-analysis, a total of 196 patients, again, shortened hospital stay. Uh, you can use intercostal cryo for rib fractures in an acute pain settings and again shorter hospital stay better uh, opioid use or less opioid use so getting to the so to summarize what we discussed you can use cryoablation uh, for any peripheral nerves 
where we understand the function of the nerve, so we understand what we will take away, we have a good diagnostic block, and uh, we can identify the nerve with ultrasound, fluoro, or landmark, but you need to be really sure because the ice ball will be only so big. So uh, that's important to remember. You can use it for joint denervation. Uh, there are some studies for knee denervation. Uh, and also you can use it in an acute setting or a perioperative setting. The risk of harm with radio frequency, I would say, theoretically, is bigger than with cryo. Uh, because of the coagulation of the nerve and PRF should be the least harmful of course assuming that we are not actually damaging the nerves with the needles themselves. The length of relief uh, radio frequency lasts longer uh, I would say than cryoablation but both of them last significantly longer than PRF. The functional loss is really a complete anesthesia with cryo patient complain let's say complete numbness when you do um, infraorbital a bit more than with radio frequency and certainly more than with PRF. And the price uh, is changing slowly but cryo seems to be the most expensive. It's coming down to be cheaper and, and reaching uh, radio frequency and PRF. So you can target any nerve. There's going to be no neuroma formation. I would say no neuritis. It will give you a six-month benefit technically a bit more tricky than radio frequency because it's a bigger probe and the number of publications are coming up and here is my family my son and my husband on a beautiful winter hike in the covid times thank you very much for your attention